So without any further ado, thank you so much and welcome Sonia. Thank you so much. Good evening. Good evening. I do call and response. Yes, I need you to talk to me. It is such an honor and a pleasure to be here at uh, Monash University and to be here in Melbourne, Australia. It is my first time um, here and I've had an amazing uh, experience and um, look forward to um, the next couple of days where I'll be able to spend uh, with Jane Wilkinson and Jeff Brooks and I want to thank both of you for your very kind invitation and hospitality and that of Amanda Heffernan as well. Um, I feel very welcome, um, as does my husband, Stephen Horsford, who is also joining us and will be uh, delivering a talk on tomorrow, and I'm going to actually plug that because I think it will be of interest to many of you. Um, it is called From Obama's Hope to Trump's Fear, The Changing Face and Future of American Politics. Um, and so we are certainly, uh, as American citizens, concerned about um, what is happening in our country and the world um, and believe I, that education uh, really plays an important and critical role in that. And so um, today I'm going to talk about um, my work, really, um, mostly um, on the book called Learning in a Burning House um, and also some of the work that I've done um, since that book was published in 2011. Um, as Jane mentioned, um, I'm really interested in the legacy of race and racism uh, in America um, and its implications for education and schools and children and families and communities. Um, and basically, I think that unless we really centralize um, the realities of race and racism in our analysis, we won't really be able to identify um, the policy solutions, the leadership strategies and practices that will actually help to um, advance equal educational opportunities for all children. So I want to start actually by reading um, a portion of the introduction of the book, which I think helps to frame uh, my interest in this work and how I came to, um, to become interested in the topic of school desegregation and race and education. Desegregation is a joke. I could hardly believe my eyes. In my quest for interesting historical perspectives and remarks about desegregation, I stumbled across these four words quoted from the late singer and songwriter Nina Simone. The undersized sentence held oversized meaning. And I immediately became intrigued yet saddened by its resonance. Simone's words, much like her melancholy lyrics and brooding voice, captured the disappointment and pain you feel when you've been lied to. The hardness that develops when you have decided you can trust no more. It was almost worse than Langston Hughes' oft-quoted stench and sagging of a dream deferred because it suggested that the dream, in this case, desegregation, was never serious to begin with. It was the sentiment of disappointment and cynicism expressed by African Americans who lived under segregation, questioned, and in many ways, regretted desegregation that grabbed me many years ago. How could this be? Some blamed desegregation for destroying the tight-knit, supportive, and self-contained black communities that supported black underachievement, Others said it created many of the problems of underachievement, high school education placements, behavioral deferrals, and high school dropout rates that plague black education today. Others engaged in what Lonnie Guineer described as the eerie nostalgia of the golden era of segregation for black people, reveling in memories of communal black villages that were home to black barbers, doctors, markets, preachers, businesses, watchful neighbors, nurturing teachers, good schools, and a sense of community. And so then I began to um, really think about the different ways in which um, the issues of civil rights and race and education and desegregation uh, were being documented, uh, particularly in the education literature. And I stumbled across um, a really interesting um, and impactful quote um, by Dr. Martin Luther King, and it was actually Harry Belafonte and Marion Wright Edelman and others who were a part of his close inner circle who were actively engaged in um, the civil rights movement and um, recount a story where um, right before his death, they had met with him, um, and he was very despondent. I mean, there were threats against his life. Um, it was a very dark time um, and violent time for those who were advocating for civil rights. Um, and he shocked his confidants and fellow activists at a strategy meeting in New York at the home of Harry Belafonte, and he told them, we have fought long and hard for integration, as I believe we should have, and I know that we will win. 
but I've come to believe we're integrating into a burning house. I'm afraid that America may be losing what moral vision she may have had. And I'm afraid that even as we integrate, we are walking into a place that does not understand that this nation needs to be deeply concerned with the plight of the poor and disenfranchised. And until we commit ourselves to ensuring that the underclass is given justice and opportunity, we will continue to perpetuate the anger and violence that tears at the soul of this nation. And so his words really, I think, continue to reflect some of the challenges that we face today in our country by ignoring the poor, the disenfranchised, um, and those who happen to identify with a particular racial background. And so this was an example also of the chance encounter that I had with a researcher that I really respected at the American Educational Research Association as a doctoral student. And it was Asa Hilliard, who I was blessed enough to meet back in 2006. And um, I had successfully defended my dissertation. I was at AERA, and I got to meet him. I was so excited to tell him um, what I was working on, that I had defended my proposal. And it was a study about uh, school integration. And, he smiled at me, <laughs> and he looked and said, integration never happened. Um, to which point, as you could imagine, as a doctoral student who thought that she was on her way to finishing, um, had to wait for her heart to start beating again. Uh, and my mind wondered, why could I have not received this information maybe two years earlier? But Dr. Hilliard quickly put me at ease. Uh, with his knowing eyes and smile, he explained to me that the very important distinction between integration and desegregation, and that in his opinion, integration never really happened in any meaningful way because students were still segregated by race in their quote unquote desegregated schools. And that based on this conversation, I searched high and low for definitions of desegregation to better understand the perspectives of black scholars and educators who had really written about this issue but whose voices really weren't necessarily a part of the mainstream narrative around desegregation. And so while many people continue to use the terms interchangeably, um, desegregation is not the same as integration. Um, Adair, in his book, Desegregation, the Illusion of Black Progress, defined it as the physical reassignment of children and staff to change the existing racial composition in schools. Um, the Office of Civil Rights defined it as a quality of education and interpersonal interaction uh, based on the positive acceptance of individual and group differences. Um, Dr. Martin Luther King, in his speech, The Ethical Demands of Integration, uh, characterized integration as a creative, more profound, and far-reaching than desegregation type of genuine intergroup, interpersonal dialogue. And so you see the distinctions being desegregation focused on quantifying the numbers of students from different backgrounds being in the same spaces to integration where you have perfect social equality and mutual respect. Okay. And that is why Dr. Hilliard suggested that we had never really yet achieved integration. We are in spaces where we have physical proximity to one another, but not spiritual affinity, to use his words. And so how do we move from the place where, again, we're quantifying and mixing bodies, where we can be in a space like this and have a diversity of people representing a variety of racial and ethnic backgrounds, which is one thing, but how do we create this beloved community where we really view each other as equals? Right? and value and respect all that each of us have to bring to the table. And so this has um, continued to be something that I'm trying to figure out and how to explore. How do we do that? How do we create this beloved community? How do we move from discussions in schools around desegregation and diversity and inclusion to discussions around true, meaningful integration where we can enjoy um, uh, mutual respect and equal respect for the lives of individuals who may not look like us? Okay? And so that's really the task and the goal of doing this work. And so while some scholars even have framed the return to segregated schools as resegregation in America, which is a, a very um, hot topic that's currently taking place in our country, scholars who hearken to voices of color and the experiential knowledge they bring and the extent to which schools have really never integrated in the first place, um, I think continue to really underscore the need for us to explore our history to better understand the contemporary manifestations of inequality today. And so Dr. Kenneth B. Clark was one of um, the um, expert witnesses in the Brown versus Board of Education decision, which took place in 1954 in America. And this is a case that we celebrate and commemorate uh, every year um, because it declared that separate schools are inherently unequal. 
But I would argue that many of us still equate that as America being committed to educational equality, but that's not really what the decision declared. And in fact, um, many legal scholars have suggested that on an international scale and for a public relations kind of message to send to the international community, that the Supreme Court in 1954 decided unanimously to end a system of segregation that had been in place for over 100 years. And many of it was because um, and, you know, people in Russia were able to watch the demonstrations on television, and the Supreme Court needed to send a message that, um, yes, we actually do value and provide equal opportunities to all children, because the criticism abroad was that you have an entire group of second-class citizens in your country, but yet you're, you want to tell us how we should run our own country, right? And so part of that is problematic because the intent and the motivation behind the Brown decision, as some critical scholars would suggest, never was, in, it was never really designed to create the system of educational equality. And so that intention, because it really was not, again, to create equality, has not really manifested that over time. And so we're still grappling with issues of inequality and segregation to this very day. And now it's called resegregation, um, but one might argue that we were always separate. Okay, even if we were in the same spaces. And so one of the other, I think, interesting things when we look at the voices and experiences of black scholars, um, civil rights activists, and those who had been in this fight for a very long time, is that at the end of their careers, um, they'd reflect on the fact that they didn't recognize how difficult, entrenched, and embedded racism was. That they thought that if we only could change the laws of the land, that if we could end government-sanctioned segregation, that if we could kill Jim Crow, we would be able to then usher in an era of integration, right, and inclusion. Uh, but in fact, as Kenneth B. Clark, who was, again, the expert witness who administered the Dahl test with his wife, uh, Mamie Clark, is part of the Brown decision, which indicated, basically, for those who may not be familiar with the Dahl test, um, they would have children come into court and they would have a black doll and a white doll. And they would ask the child, which one, which doll is the smart doll? and the black child would pick the white doll. Uh, which doll is the intelligent doll? The white doll. Which doll is the beautiful doll? The white doll. And so that was his evidence that he submitted to suggest that separate schools created a badge of infer inferiority for black children. That by enforcing or making black children only attend these schools, you were then suggesting that one group was inferior to another. And that is why we need to have integrated schools. Okay? But after observing 40 years after that, 40 years after that landmark decision, uh, Dr. Clark said that, um, with the advantage of hindsight, it is difficult to understand that these attempts of busing, affirmative action, or devices or words or approaches are used to disguise the continuation of American racism. And so I think one of the important and telling things in terms of looking at um, those who did fight the good fight in the 1960s and were really advocating for civil rights was even their underestimation of the power of racism, right? And so what do we do with that and what can we learn from that and how I, might we change our strategies and approaches and understanding to be able to be more successful as we move forward? And so after searching the education research literature, particularly as it relates to, to race and racism, I was struck by the absence of black or African American voices, knowledge, and leadership perspectives, which to me seemed like a missed opportunity to really understand what it was like to attend segregated schools or to work in segregated schools, and then to lead uh, segregated schools or desegregated schools. And so in this case, I really wanted to understand, and I thought that there would be a lot to learn from the K-12 school superintendent because the superintendent oftentimes would be the one responsible for um, administering or leading desegregation plans, right? Because you had multiple schools and then you had an opportunity to really change attendance zones or um, develop different policy strategies to facilitate um, more desegregated learning. And so this was really the, um, the basis for the book, Learning in a Burning House. Am I going the right way? Um, and another piece that was really critical to this work, because um, all of this came from my dissertation, by the way, so if there's doctoral students who are here, um, pick something that you love and that you're interested in, because um, it really can be, um, 
I would say a lifelong journey in terms of pursuing a, a line of inquiry that you're passionate about um, and that can really make a contribution to the field, you know, because you are so engaged in it. And I feel like this is something that I've been very passionate about. Um, and although it wasn't very popular at the time um, that I had proposed this dissertation, um, there is an increasing interest in it now, um, which saddens me in many ways because I thought that uh, in 2004 or 2008 with the election of Barack Obama that maybe I would be having to identify a new research agenda. Um, but in actuality, <laughs> it became even more relevant, right? Um, and actually confirmed, I think, my suspicions around uh, the power and depth of, of American racism. And so, um, I guess I skip something here. Okay. So one of the things that I want to discuss tonight is the framework that I've developed for supporting education leaders um, who are committed to racial and social justice. And so through this work and learning from the perspectives of individuals in this study, um, I have developed a kind of a way of thinking about race and racial literacy and how we can better equip ourselves to have these conversations and to um, engage in policy conversations that can help us, again, move the needle in terms of how we can advocate for racial inequality or racial equality through education. Um, before I do that, I want to address some of the, the assumptions that I am, um, a few assumptions that I hold as I engage in this work. Um, I'm often asked um, by many people, why do you only focus on black children? Uh, why do you locate your work within this black-white binary? binary? Um, and why study the black school superintendent? They're so few in number, and what can we really learn from them? Um, but I believe it's that it's, there's a lot that we can learn about the black freedom struggle for equal education in America um, because black people in many cases still constitute what Derrick Bell, the legal scholar and father of critical race theory, suggests are the faces at the bottom of the well. And so while, while there are a lot of discussions about race and class and whether it's really a class issue or whether we're really talking about race, um, there are a lot of examples in America that would suggest it's not about class. There are a lot of people who have money <laughs> and wealth and education and status, much like the President of the United States did, um, but still really face um, the very challenging and damaging uh, realities of racism. And so because of that, I feel that if we better understand those at the bottom of the well, we'll be able to create a system that benefits everyone that's a part of the system, okay? And so that's really my intentional focus on looking at black or African American children. Uh, and that if we're really to truly address the education of all children, we have to be honest about the fact that America has a racial caste system. We talk a lot about the American dream and it being the land of opportunity. But when we look at the data, whether it's in education, in access to health care or health outcomes, employment rates, you name it, you can predict where blacks, Latinos, Asians, and whites will fall on that scale. And that's only one aspect of someone's identity that's a social and political construction. Okay? And so I think we have to really think about the system that we're in, expose it, uh, and as researchers really make that central to our inquiry because it has such an impact on every aspect of American life. And I also suggest that the system is not broken, uh, but that it's doing exactly what it was designed to do. And so by understanding the history of American education and those who actually had access to education, when we think about our indigenous populations who were taken from their land and placed in boarding schools and civilized, if you will, who are still con to this day in abhor just abhorrent conditions um, in government-run schools. When we look at the fact that um, black children did not have access to public education, when we look at the fact that they didn't know what to do with the mongoloid child, whether or not they were black or white and what school to put them in, these are the things that we have to recognize as part of the system and that it was designed to create the stratification. And so when we recognize that the system was created to perpetuate inequality, then I would argue that our approach is different in terms of how we fix it. Okay, that it's really, it really isn't broken. Um, and that the continued resistance to educating black children and youth underscores the fact that the black freedom struggle for equal education is a political act that um, educating a black child still today is something that for some reason faces fierce resistance in many ways. And so why is that? When we think about again the history of forbidding slaves to read, not being able to be literate, that we, di that it, well not we, but individuals diagnosed slaves that ran away from the masters as drapedomania. It was a disease for a slave, a slave to want to leave to um, become free, that that was a medical diagnosis. Um, again, it, I think it compels us to really think about um, the aims 
of the education system and the larger society in which uh, black people have, have overcome in many ways but are still very much trapped in. Um, and that this political act also must be linked to a, the, mo the movement for social justice, right? And so as, as, although I'm speaking about black and African American children in this particular context and presentation, I think we can see a lot of similarities with different um, ethnic cultural groups, children in poverty, um, and other communities that are underrepresented and historically marginalized in society. Okay. And finally, that this movement requires a new theory of education leadership, one that bridges race, class, gender, and religion, develops, organizes, and empowers young people, and is led by individuals who respect, care for, and understand that in order to lead the people, you must love the people. Okay. That's Cornell West, not me. And so my dissertation research, to go back to that, um, which continues to be foundational to my research agenda, was to really explore the lived experiences and perspectives of black school superintendents on school desegregation with the focus on the effective education of black children. Uh, it was guided by three primary questions, um, which I present here. Um, and as former students of all black segregated schools, um, I applied the voice of color thesis. And this suggests that based on their racial identity, they had a unique perspective and a standpoint um, that uh, may be different from those who did not attend all black segregated schools or did not, did not have that experience. Um, some would even argue it's an epistemic privilege, right, in order to be able to stand in the space and understand uh, the, the, the perspective of the oppressor as well as the oppressed, right? And so there's a benefit to, again, that double consciousness and that awareness um, of being someone who's in a, an oppressed position. And so I also use the uh, tenets of critical race theory uh, as a conceptual and analytical framework, um, seeking to document and present what appear to be missing in the research literature on issues of race, inequality, and reform, and how those insights might contribute to our knowledge and understanding of the tensions and the complexity associated with trying to ensure equal educational opportunity. Um, and so one of the, the frustrations that I have currently, and I've used the term myself as well, and I, I get it, um, is kind of our focus on educational equity and diversity. Um, without really dealing with the issues of power and identity that are embedded in that. Um, and so I really think that we have to, again, understand that history, understand um, uh, the role of power as it connects to race and identity to better uh, be able to really address the, the, the very um, difficult issues of inequality. And so critical race theory, um, the five key tenets that I uh, draw from, um, one is counter storytelling. And so this suggests that by through stories, through narratives, that there's many things that we can learn from the perspe perspectives of individuals who have been marginalized or, or disenfranchised. And in the case of education leadership research, the forgotten or missing voices of black educators, many of which were not included in a lot of the work that I was um, looking at in my field. Um, Another important piece is the critique of liberalism, and this has been um, something that has really come to the fore, I think, uh, in our current political environment, um, in terms of liberal notions of equality, uh, colorblindness, meritocracy, and things that are very much a part of the quote-unquote American dream, and the notion that schools serve as the great equalizer, but really um, don't... Uh, uh, acknowledge how the law is actually applied. So we may have a colorblind constitution, but the application of that law is a very different thing. And so how do we then engage in this critique of liberalism, which again has advanced notions of fraternity, equality, and liberty, and justice for all, at the same time, they never really have. <laughs> right, so at the same time those documents were being developed, um, there were individuals in bondage. Um, and um, that, I think, hypocrisy, um, and reality is something that we continue to see manifest itself in, in every aspect of um, American life. The third is whiteness as property. And this is, again, recognizing that um, whiteness historically has had its own value, um, that white men were the only ones that really could own property in America. Um, and the cumulative effect of that and the power associated with that continues to play out today. Um, I think a great example of how whiteness is property um, in America is the notion of passing. And so for many African Americans, again, who were of mixed race because of um, the rape and, uh, and other things that took place during slavery, right? Um, that if you were very fair, right, like I am, um, and maybe able to pass as a white person even though you had black blood, that you would risk your, you would leave your family, you would change your identity, and that you'd be willing to make that type of sacrifice 
in order to gain the privileges associated with whiteness. Okay, so I think that's a good example and illustration um, of the depth um, and the sacrifice associated with um, leaving blackness behind to engage and enjoy the freedoms associated with whiteness. Um, the fourth is interest convergence, and this um, is a theory that Derek Bell put forth where he said the black progress or racial fortuity is only achieved when the goals of blacks are consistent with that of whites. And so in the case of the Brown uh, versus Board of Education decision, um, one could argue that blacks were able to enjoy new educational opportunities only because there was a need to demonstrate to others that America actually was a land of opportunity for everyone. Okay, so as soon as, it's kind of like having a seat at the table, which is great, but that invitation can be pulled away at any time. Okay, and so that's really where interest convergence, I think, is important to the discussions of education reform. And then finally, the permanence of racism. And this is where a lot of scholars, I think, um, or people have a problem with critical race theory and feel that it's too pessimistic. Well, shouldn't we be more hopeful? Shouldn't we think that there's going to be a time when we can get rid of racism? And critical race theorists would say, you know, based on past performance, <laughs> maybe not. Um, it is a part of American life, but how do we manage and negotiate that and work in ways where we recognize it so that we can begin to dismantle it? Okay. So this is just a, a matrix to kind of give you a sense of the study participants. Um, what was interesting is that because there was such a small number of African Americans who had aspired to the superintendency at this time, that many of them all knew each other. It's like, hey, did you talk to so and so? <laughs> and have you talked to that person? Um, so even you know trying to maintain some anonymity was um, challenging. Um, but what was really fascinating is that they came from and grew up in various parts of the country. Uh, some in more rural areas, rural areas, um, some in more urban, um, the Midwest, the West, the, 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 the Northeast, the Mid-Atlantic. But their experiences were strikingly similar. Um, their accounts were very much the same in terms of their reflections of their teachers, their community, um, the communal bonds that they enjoyed in their schools, the fact that there were very high expectations from, from everyone, whether it was their parents. Um, and as one participant said, you know, even the drunk on the corner expected me to go to college. And so there was this sense of, you know, you will get an education, you will make something of yourself, and we are here to support you and people would chip in and give whatever they could to do that. Um, and so that was really striking to me that again, although these individuals grew up in different places, um, largely around the same time, um, that they had these shared narratives and there were stories similar to um, African Americans of the same age that I would encounter all the time. We'd hear you know, these stories about um, the sense of community that was there and what was lost as a result of desegregation. So there were three, um, three themes that really, um, that I co-constructed based on the experiences of the, the participating superintendents. And the first was that, um, and these are direct quotes um, from, from the participants. One was that there's nothing wrong with something being all black, okay? Um, and it was this assumption that just because the school was all black that it was bad for some reason. And they argued, you know, I attended a segregated school, and they, many of them did, and they all, you know, earned PhDs, they ended up becoming school superintendents and having very prominent positions in education. And they said that their schools really equipped them and prepared them to do that because the schools were so focused on preparing them for what they anticipated would be a desegregated world. Um, and they had the love and the support um, and the high expectations that allowed them to do that. So that was one um, really important theme that, you know, this assumption that we have to um, that if a school is all black, that we need to you know, make sure that we have other students there that, so that students can learn next to white students to be able to, to achieve. And so that has been, um, I think, an interesting conversation that continues to exist in desegregation when we think about strategies like busing or when we think about um, even um, issues of socioeconomic diversity in schools and whether or not um, you need a certain blend of perspectives to help ensure that black students have access to a high quality learning experience. The second theme was sometimes I feel like the problem started with desegregation. Um, and again, that was <laughs> surprising as well, but not when they talked about what was lost as a result of desegregation. And so one of the quotes that Derek Bell um, 
uh, shares in one of his books about an older black woman that he was interviewing and asking her about what she thought about desegregation. She said, you know, uh, we got what we fought for, but we lost what we had. Okay. And I think that um, that opportunity cost, if you will, um, and the sacrifices that were made in order to be able to attend schools in white spaces with white children in white communities is something that um, many members of the black community still struggle with today. Um, and it, even in a school desegregation study that I did in my hometown of Las Vegas, that was a common refrain. And actually, the community that had been advocating uh, tirelessly for school desegregation at some point said, you know, it's not worth the cost. It's not worth me busing my babies across town for 11 years out of their 12 years of education to desegregate other schools, um, but not, you know, not enjoy the community or be able to attend school in their own neighborhood or to engage in extracurricular activities or for me to be able to attend their school after school to participate and support them. And so that, I think, is another theme um, that continues to resonate as we think about the choices that black parents have to make as it relates to um, whether or not I send my child to an all-black neighborhood school, which may not be performing, you know, it, it, or is performing in that way, or if I should be focused on making sure that my child is able to access an integrated or desegregated school. And then the third, to echo what Asa Hilliard had told me at the time of the proposal, um, was that we'd never really truly integrated. And so that came up quite a bit as well. You know, it's like, yeah, we did the, the mixing of the bodies, and we have the court cases that required certain percentages of black children to attend schools at certain um, during the school year, but we never really integrated. And so even if you had children in the same school, um, well, in the case of St. Louis, actually, you would have children, the city schools are where the black kids were and the county schools are where the white kids went to school. And so they would, the black kids would ride the bus together, they would be in their own black classrooms, they would have their own black lunch, <laughs> they would get back on the bus and go home. Okay, and so the school, in essence, was desegregated, you could argue, at the school level, but there was no interaction, there was no interpersonal relations, there was no mutual respect or value for what each student brought to the table, okay? And I feel like this is something that we still need to address when we talk about equity and diversity. Um, are we really engaging in inclusive and diverse spaces, or is it just um, another way to talk about having multiple people um, in the same space? weren't supposed to see that just yet. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, I was really sad when I read the account of Dr. King um, and how kind of despondent he was. And I'm sure that those in his, in his inner circle were uh, really, you know, impacted. Obviously, they were putting their lives on the line um, and very committed to the cause of integration. And to hear him say, I think we may be integrating into a burning house, right? Um, that's a lot to kind of think about um, and to reflect on. And so, of course, they said, well, what do we do? What do we do now? And he said, well, we have to become firemen. Uh, we're just going to have to figure out um, how to, to um, put out the flames of this burning house. And so I thought that was a beautiful metaphor of what we need to do in terms of advancing a social justice movement or a, a movement for racial justice, that despite the triple threats of war, poverty, and racism that Dr. King warned us about, that we're just going to have to be fire women. Um, and that we're going to have to be able to work together to understand the cause of the fire, right? Because I'm not a firefighter, but um, I know that if you have an electrical fire, you need to do something different than a fire maybe that's caused by wood, right? And if you treat that the wrong way, you can make a bad situation worse. And so really understanding the source and the cause of the fire is, is really important. And so in order to do that, um, I thought it was really important for educators, uh, particularly, to understand the role of race, how it operates, what it is. And so um, the superintendent narratives and the research literature really led me to developing a critical race approach to ed equal education. And it's basically a multi-step progression from racial literacy to the aspirational goal of racial reconciliation. Uh, racial literacy is simply the ability to understand what race is, why it is, and how it is used to reproduce inequality and oppression. And so while we often talk about race is the color of one's skin, or the texture of one's hair, the shape of one's eye, in terms of trying to identify someone's racial background, it's, it's so much more. It's about the system used to reproduce inequality and oppression. It's about power. I think that's an important first step for us to understand if we want to begin to dismantle it. Um, as, um, 
Evelyn Hammonds mentioned, um, and she's an evolutionary biologist, she said that race is a concept that was invented to categorize the perceived biological, social, and cultural differences between human groups. Okay, so a lot of this is about perception and the meaning that we attach to racial groups. Okay, and it's very powerful because although race is not real, it's a social and political construction, it is real. Because the meaning that we attach to what it, it, it is to be black or to be white or to be Latina or to be Asian, that, it, it's, it's very real to the individuals who have to walk in that space, right? And so I think the important thing to know is that it was a concept that was invented to do exactly what it's doing. Uh, and how it's currently operating. The second is racial realism, and this is simply acknowledging that race and racism are not artifacts of the past. Um, I think the present moment <laughs> doesn't necessarily require this step as much uh, as it has bef it, as it did before, um, but it's a very uh, real and ongoing uh, part of life that we have to address in order to be able to tackle the problems that we cannot turn a blind eye uh, to the realities of racism. Um, it's painful. It's um, difficult, it's messy, um, it's uncomfortable, um, but even more so for those who have to live with uh, the consequences of racism. And so how do we at least begin to again acknowledge this so that we can have the informed conversations um, around how to, begin, how to uh, advance, advance racial justice? And so race has been used to discriminate and to distribute resources unequally and set up different standards for protection under the law. And this is where it becomes very real and impact, impacts where people are able to live, right? Whether or not you can buy a home in a particular neighborhood, um, whether or not your child can attend a particular school, whether or not you can get a job and um, has huge implications for the quality of life of individuals. And so it's not just about whether or not you like me or I'm being discriminated against based on my race, but the fact that my life choices and opportunities are limited as a result of race. Okay? And so that's what race, racial realism uh, forces us to think about. This is an image from the Dahl test that I was uh, referencing earlier from 1954. The third step is racial reconstruction. And so based on the fact that race is a human invention, um, I argue that we can ascribe new meaning to race in order to transform the ways that we think about it. So if we created race, is there a way to uh, change the meanings that we attach to different racial groups to help us move toward perfect social equality, right? To, to get rid of some of those stereotypes um, and, and the negative deficit thinking that comes with particular racial groups so that we can really experience equality. Uh, and so, as Hammond said, she said, race is a human invention, we created it, and we can think ourselves out of it. And so this is my challenge as a researcher and for researchers. How do we think ourselves out of it? How do we conduct and engage an inquiry um, and think about how we might be able to dismantle racism, or at least in the meantime, as a step to that, change the meanings that we attach to race to where it's not part of a hierarchy or it's not part of a caste system, that, that, that there's differences but really diminish the power that's associated with different racial groups. Okay. She said, we made it, and we can unmake it. And I agree with that claim. And finally, um, the last step is racial re reconciliation. Um, and this is um, healing the wounds that have been inflicted um, and the damage done in schools as a result of inequality and racism. And I think this is a part that we often um, don't acknowledge and we kind of jump over in terms of trying to provide access and opportunity. How do you heal the damage that's been done? How, how do we really take that time to acknowledge what has happened uh, and, 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 and know that those, that historical reality still has implications for what's happening today? As I was sharing with others the other day, there's an African proverb that says, uh, you know, the ax forgets, but the tree remembers, <laughs> right? And so it's, it's one thing to be the person who's dominating and oppressing and wanting to move on from that past. Well, that was the past, we're moving on. You know, everything is fair, fair now, but the tree remembers. You can't chop down a tree and think that that's not gonna affect that tree for generations and generations to come, okay? And the impact, again, on the larger area in the context. So historical trauma theory is another area that I'm particularly interested in. Um, this work comes out of the public health work and also um, from indigenous communities and looking at the fact that populations that have been subjected to mass trauma over periods of time will continue to experience that trauma. And so you can't displace people. 
you can't continue to engage in reforms and experiment on children and think that it doesn't have a longer lasting impact than the particular policy approach or strategy that you're implementing to help improve something in the short term. We really have to think about um, the, the historical, again, trauma that many communities have faced and continue to face. Um, and there's many ways that um, populations are subjugated, and I, I, we see a lot of this in education, particularly around gentrification, um, displacement, the politics of disposability, school closures, and we're seeing this all, often in black and brown communities, and it's not by accident. And so when you think about the physical and psychological violence that's taking place against particular communities, the segregation and displacement, um, lack of economic opportunity, and then also cultural dispossession, taking away the culture, the values, the belief systems, you know, diminishing that for particular cultures and thinking that's not going to have a long-term impact. We can change laws and policies, but there, we will still, again, experience the negative ramifications um, of the trauma that we place and, and for certain communities to experience. And so um, one of the things um, that has been really helpful for me in thinking about new ways of leadership um, and new paradigms of leadership and how educators and education leaders might think about uh, leadership is the work of Ella Baker and other black women leaders who have been able to negotiate you know, the really challenging, um, the, or the challenges they face based on their race and gender. And so when you think about black women uh, during the civil rights movement who were not, who were kind of pushed to the back um, in the civil rights movement, it was the men that really were out front um, and receiving a lot of the credit, although they were the ones really organizing and working right behind the scenes. Or in the white women's suffrage movement where Again, black women were working, but were still experiencing racism. And so I felt like there was so much to learn from being in that, in that space of intersectionality, right? Like, how do you move in those spaces where you're being oppressed, but you're still trying to work to advance your race and your gender? And Ella Baker um, is someone that I deeply admire, and she was very active in the civil rights movement. She believed that students and young people were really the ones that were going to make the change and advance the civil rights movement, and she was right. Um, and her theory was that strong people don't need strong leaders. That if you build and invest in people, right, and students and giving them voice and agency, that that's, that should really be the goal of leadership. And she would remind people that Martin didn't make the movement. The movement made Martin, right? And so thinking about, again, the collective nature of what we can accomplish together, rather than find, looking for one person to be that leader for us, it's us. We have to work together collectively to invest and support one another um, and not necessarily look to a leader to do it, but realize that um, as strong people, we'll be able to accomplish a lot more together than we can apart. And so I close with a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King, and this was from his Nobel Peace Prize speech um, called Learning in the World House. And, um, you know, as the prophet that he was, he talked about the fact that we would be able to um, fly across the world in a matter of hours, right, with ob automation and cybernation, that we'd be able to communicate in ways that we currently don't, um, and that we're living in this large house, a great world house, in which we have to live together, a family unduly separated in ideas, culture, and interests, who, because we can never again live apart, must learn somehow to live with each other in peace. And so I call on us to think about the ways in which we can learn and live together in the world house. That from this burning house, uh, we can rise from the ashes and rebuild a beloved community. Teaching, leading, and learning in the world house. A place that everyone can call home. Thank you. We have about 10 minutes for questions, comments. We can go a little later if we need to. And we also have our live stream people who may also wish to ask questions or make comments. So I'm aware of that and they can be busily typing away. And Chantelle is going to relay um, what they say or questions they have. So to begin with, uh, someone from the audience, comments, questions? Provocations. 
provocations. <laughs> Jill, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Look, thank you very much. It was extremely powerful. Um, and it, it relates so much to um, what goes on in Australia too, obviously. Um, I suppose I'm a bit interested about your, your proposals about leadership and those principles. What would you say to a principal of a, one of the desegregated schools in terms of going through those phases that you talked about, what would you, what would be the strategy you should get them to, to do it actually at that level? Mm -hmm. um, I think for the principal, really getting a strong understanding of the history of your own school community um, would be a, a way to start um, understanding the perspectives of the community and what has happened in that community that might inform how parents, um, grandparents, family members, and the students um, <laughs> are connected to the school, their expectations for the school, um, to help inform the ways in which that leader is approaching um, the community that they're leading. So one of the things that critical race theory, I think, helps us with is um, the historical perspective and also telling stories. And so really gaining knowledge and information uh, from those local community members to better understand um, their needs, their desires, and their expectations for the school. Um, one of the interesting things that I found out in doing the work in Las Vegas, which is a fairly young city, um, was that you had so many new teachers and administrators coming in to that area who had no idea of the history of desegregation and, w and the trauma in many ways that parents and families went through. And so once they understood that, they said, oh, that's why they don't really trust me. <laughs> that's why they don't really want to engage with the school district or the system. And so I think having that understanding helps us to better approach um, relationship building and developing the trust that we know is important for school leaders to have. <laughs> um, Sonia, it was really interesting to see you um, identify the tenets of CRT that you did um, from, in a way, you're choosing from among many that are out there, right? Um, I wonder if in your own work, it seems to me you're having a platform, or especially around highlighting the importance of history to, to add to those tenets or, you know, as you've done your work over the, you know, the last several years, I mean, do you see sort of uh, certain dynamics emerging that you maybe didn't see before that have become more important to, to look at more closely? I do. I mean, it really has compelled me to look more at the, um, the research in other disciplines, really, in anthropology and sociology. Um, in evolutionary biology, right, and geneticism, and kind of understanding how other disciplines are talking about race. Um, and so it, again, showed me how much I don't know even about race when we talk about racial literacy, um, that we're really scraping the surface um, and thinking about those competing paradigms and making sense of how we think about race. And even as researchers, how we're writing about it. Um, and so I'm really interested, again, in how we're studying it, how we're using it in our own research, because we really continue to perpetuate it in research. We use these same categories that are very problematic. Um, and so we're just doing the same thing in terms of reproducing inequality and in how we're talking about and naming um, and comparing communities, again, based off of a pseudo-scientific concept. So that's something I grapple with. Um, some days I think we need to get rid of race altogether, um, and other days I think you know we need to maybe just change how we're talking about it and the meaning that we attach to it until we get to the point where we can get rid of it altogether. Um, and that there's also probably more value in talking about culture um, and thinking about the cultural um, contributions and assets and values um, and even assumptions that come to the fore as opposed to putting people in these very problematic racial categories. And so it's something that I still struggle with, but I know that there's still a lot uh, to be learned from, again, the other disciplines. Thank you. Yes. 
You talk about the historical trauma theory and uh, populations historically subjected to long-term trauma. I was wondering if um, through your research and your reading you've done any um, um, research on anti-Semitism and history of, um, for example, anti-Semitism directed against Jewish people. But I, you know, I think one of the useful things about historical trauma theory is that um, we can see so many examples, right, across context, across time, at a local level, on a national scale. Um, and so I think that's also another way in which we can see some of the shared experiences um, that communities have, which will help us to better connect and understand that we have so much more in common than different. Um, and so to answer your question, no, I haven't personally, but um, I would imagine that there is extensive work there. And the more that we can think about collectively um, conducting research that draws from those different experiences, we can, again, hopefully find ways to prevent <laughs> the continual preparation, uh, perpetuation of trauma uh, for communities. <laughs> yeah. I have a question, Sonia, <laughs> of course. Um, I'm interested in um, preparation of teachers and educational leaders and what are the kinds of things that we can be thinking about as academics and as um, educators when it comes to really challenging our own beliefs but and, and our own practices that are perpetuating exactly the kinds of things that you've so beautifully illustrated here. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, one very kind of simple but still complex um, activity that I have my students do, for example, is a sociocultural autobiography. And I'm sure many of us do that. Um, but I think it's really powerful because we often don't get a chance to really reflect on our own educational experiences. You know, how did you, how did you um, understand? What experiences led you to hold a certain set of values for education? Um, how, do you, how did you come to understand the importance of education in your life? Was it your parents? What did they tell you about it? What were the experiences that you had in school? Were they positive? Um, were you encouraged? Were there high expectations set for you or were you discouraged? And can you remember that teacher from the second grade that told you that you wouldn't be able to do what it is that you wanted to do? Um, and so it's a really powerful, I think, um, way to engage in the practice of reflection. Um, and I find that um, whether it's master students, doctoral students, and in independent private schools and public systems, um, that that can be a very powerful exercise and something they don't get an opportunity to do, to sit and think about how they um, came to have the set of values that they have around education or the assumption that they have about other groups of people. Um, and just giving us that time to reflect. I think educators, um, you know, it's, people are so busy that we're doing, but we don't have the time to think about what we're doing and whether or not we're engaging in practices um, that we may not even believe in. I'm, I'm really interested to hear about what some of your research revealed about the intersection of the impact of the financial crisis and race on the communities that those superintendents were serving. I noticed you had a range of areas that they were serving and I wondered what you found. You know, it's interesting. One of the, <laughs> the missed opportunities for my study was talking more about, I think, their work in the, in the districts. Um, because I spent so much time really getting a sense of their, you know, their experience as, stu as students and then their perspectives on desegregation. Um, but, you know, again, um, living through one of uh, the worst economic recessions that we had in America, knowing that the safety net for those who are already vulnerable um, is pretty much non-existent. Um, and um, that when you think about I remember. Richard Reeves, uh, he does work at the Brookings Institution. He talks about the, not the glass ceiling, but the glass floor. And that those who have resources and wealth um, will only fall so far. That they're almost protected from really suffering um, too badly when there is a recession or a financial crisis. And so I think that's an important concept to think about as well. Um, that while certain people may not have um, a lot, and have survived kind of without a lot for long periods of time and are able to kind of adjust uh, with that, that we also have um, 
increasing economic inequality and reduced social mobility that in times of crisis uh, makes it very devastating for individuals who are at the bottom of the well, um, but still provides many, many protections for those who have a lot of resources. And I think um, the problem of widening inequality is something that we should all really be concerned about because um, there is no reason why certain individuals should be protected from that um, because we are inter interconnected and interdependent. I do believe that we're, you know, we're, we're living in this world house. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that education should be really a way in which people can um, provide some sense of security um, to ensure that they're not devastated when we are impacted by a financial crisis. Just at the time, and I know we promised we'd finish at seven, but I think we do have someone from the, the live streaming. Okay, Sonia, we've got um, someone from the live streaming saying that it's the first time they've heard of historical trauma theory. Um, so they're very interested to look up more on it. Um, but they are wondering about the overlaps with other approaches and perspectives from diverse disciplines. So does it overlap with other disciplines? Oh, absolutely. So it actually came from an article um, that was written by some of a public health uh, scholar and looking at health disparities. And so it was really focused on the health disparities that individuals from communities that experience historical trauma suffered from. And so we see this a lot, whether it's, you know, heart disease, um, diabetes, I mean, right, just all of the things that are associated with maybe living in poverty or um, the stress of being um, a victim of oppression and racism. And so it actually came out of that public health literature, um, but I think that we can see a lot of similarities in how it still um, has a huge impact in, in fields like education. And one of the areas that a lot of students that I work with are interested in is the trauma of students um, and how, as teachers, they're able to really provide the support that they need for students who are exposed to ongoing violence um, are experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder based on gun violence, poverty, and the things that they're witnessing on a daily basis repeatedly without any type of uh, intervention, counseling, therapy, or anything else. And so it's a huge problem, and we know it has implications for how children learn and whether or not they're able to learn. Um, and so we can address it through counseling and therapy, but we need to prevent it. Um, and so I think Again, that theory is something that we, we should continue to explore um, because it's really impacting our communities uh, at a very large scale. Sonia, just quickly, um, just to follow up on that, is there overlap with stereotype threat? I'm not sure. I mean, there may be some, I think, connections to that um, because they're probably, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure in terms of the public health implications of stereotype threat. Um, I think there is work that shows that certain populations, because of the stress of racism and, and the negative impact of, uh, of racism, have experienced um, higher problems with, with health, which fuel health disparities. Yeah. Um, I Thank you again, Sonia. Um, it's been a really powerful and compelling lecture, and I, and I think um, remember that on Thursday we are going from 9.30 till 3. Uh, we have an academic community um, globalisation leadership and policy day with Sonia, uh, with Stephen, her partner, and uh, we have some various other presenters as well and time for discussion. But look, on behalf of us all, I'd just again like to say um, thank you so much for your 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 talk. Um, I learned a lot, and I thought I thought I knew a bit about this this area, but I did learn a great deal. And I think there's there's a real wisdom in what you've shared with us, and so many more things to explore and to learn from you. But on behalf of us all, thank you so much. Thank you.